Good day. My name is Robert McBride. I am the international president of Lambda Alpha International. Founded in 1930, LAI is the Honorary Society for Land Economics, now comprised of 26 chapters in many parts of the world. The membership consists of outstanding individuals who have distinguished themselves in all of the various disciplines and activities that relate to the use of land. As an organization, LAI acts to connect professionals, share knowledge, and advance best practices. Today, I am very pleased to welcome each of you to this webinar presentation hosted by the LAI Global Chapter. The Global Chapter exists to serve as an active link between LAI members having international interests in land economics, wherever they may reside. Today, our speaker is Les Pollock. Les is an urban planner with 50 years of working experience. Les is a founder of Cameros Limited, a US planning consultancy with a national practice in strategic and neighborhood planning and zoning. Les is also a long serving member of LAI, having served as president of the Ely chapter in Chicago and as international president in 2008-2009. Les currently serves as chair of the LAI Global Chapter. In 2017, Les chose to travel around the world via Southeast Asia, China, Russia, the Upper Balkans, Israel, Rome, Morocco, and Paris. Uh, we're so pleased to have Les present the highlights of this trip from his perspective as a planner and world traveler. I'm sure we are all looking forward to hearing about his experiences and the lessons he learned through the course of his remarkable journey. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Les. Thank you, Robert, uh, and greetings to all, uh, uh, either fellow travelers or, or people who are interested in becoming fellow travelers. Uh, this. Um, this trip uh, that I took really had its genesis in, in, in my long-term desire to travel the Trans-Siberian Railway. Uh, so I figured if I was gonna do that, I might as well hook together uh, some other uh, components and, and make it around the world uh, voyage, if you will. And you can see by the, the map in front of you that uh, it was a trip through uh, Southeast Asia, uh, crossing uh, uh, China to get to uh, uh, Beijing and uh, uh, get on the Trans-Siberian there, headed towards Moscow. Just a small bit about the Trans-Siberian. Uh, there are three routes. Uh, there's the Mos moscow Vladivostok route, uh, the, the Moscow-Manchuria-Beijing uh, route, and the Moscow-Mongolia-Beijing route. And I, I chose the latter, um, which was about a 5,000-mile journey uh, that uh, took me through Russia and took me about a month to get uh, uh, across Russia there. And, after leaving Moscow, flying to, uh, to Bucharest in the upper uh, Balkans, touring Romania, uh, Bulgaria, uh, northern Greece, um, then a side trip off to uh, Israel to spend time with my daughter, uh, and then home via Rome, uh, Morocco, and, and Paris. Uh, so we start this, uh, what did I learn? Um, I learned quite a bit. You learn a lot about yourself as, a, as well as others. I traveled mostly alone. Uh, and uh, I, I learned that cities are really becoming similar. The ghosted images in the back there uh, it would be hard to discern to tell you uh, which uh, which city is uh, uh, in which continent, if you will. Uh, there is a, uh, global retailing is in fashion across the globe. You will see some of the same retailers wherever you go, uh, especially fast fashion like Zara and and. Uh, um, uh, uh, H and M, uh, you will you will see similar architecture uh, the whole way. We have a global form of architecture. Uh, a lot of the uh, the large scale architecture has lost its local character, um, and cities are all becoming auto dominant. Uh, because and because transport structures development, uh, you see that uh, while we have pedestrians everywhere, especially in the in the central cores and the commercial cores, auto growth uh, is rampant. Uh, yet, uh, in many cities, mass transit is still key to communities, and 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 kudos to the um, uh, the Eastern European and socialist countries, which have continued to invest in their transit, 
uh, and especially across Russia and uh, uh, in uh, uh, Eastern Europe and the Balkans in their subway systems. Um, clearly, the central place model is still alive and well while malls are reshaping commerce and, and, and weakening the, the small retailer. Um, these malls are also being found in cities of all sizes, closing the gap between cities and towns in, in terms of character. Travel for an English speaker is easy. Um, English is almost global. The only problem I had was in, uh, in uh, Siberia, uh, where I, uh, I had to learn a bit of Russian. Um, and also, frankly, in, um, in, in Morocco, where if you get out of the tourist areas, English uh, disappears and you need either Berber, Arabic, or French. And I really had to struggle with my fractured French. Tourism is rampant. Um, the, uh, the, the historic patterns of German tourists all over or Japanese tourists all over is now being replaced with Chinese tourists all over. And you see, follow the flags and you'll, you'll find the Chinese groups moving through. Uh, I, I've met people all across the, uh, the world as I traveled, um, mostly people I shared cabins with on trains or uh, benches with on rivers uh, or seats with on buses. I uh, had occasional guides uh, who I spent time with as well, and you can see the variety of people there. Uh, and I start my trip in Singapore, and, and this trip is going to probably take a, a little longer than a, a TED Talk. I'm thinking it may take almost two TED Talks, so please bear with me. Uh, Singapore is a fascinating city. You see before you at night um, the Marina Bay Sands Hotel. Uh, with uh, three towers with a spaceship laying on top of it trying to launch itself. Um, a, a fascinating uh, uh, city-state of mixed culture. Many of you may have been there. Uh, highly diverse architecture and a, an authoritarian government who actually earns its, its, its money, its revenues uh, through land lease. Uh, they don't sell land. Uh, so the uh, And they're, they're well trained in dealing with uh, market impact. So in the top center picture, you see the interchange of area of the interchange of two subways on Orchard Road, a two kilometer lo long shopping district, uh, all full of malls interconnected underground because the heat is, is, is sometimes ghastly. Um, they held that property in front of the picture and uh, off, the, off the market for a number of years until the subways were connected. Uh, the TOD uh, impacts were felt. Land values went up and they then they, they uh, leased the property. So uh, they're they're very thoughtful about uh, how they carry that out. You see uh, the mix of, of, uh, of uh, neighborhoods, uh, the Indian neighborhoods, Chinese neighborhoods, Arab neighborhoods that are found throughout the city, uh, mixed in with, uh, with a whole variety of, of new architecture. Um, traveling north um, for about five hours by bus, uh, you, you cross into Malaysia and uh, you, you cross into Kuala Lumpur, it's, its capital city. Um, this is frankly a city with no there there, uh, which surprised me because it's the, uh, the site of Petronas Towers and other clusters of high rises. But the activity on the ground is 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 not befitting that of a central area. In fact, the key transit stop central is is in another location. Uh, but they do provide an awful lot of transit options. Uh, you see in the lower left a rather clunky. Uh, design of a monorail system that operates together with a with an LRT system and a BRT system, uh, and the ubiquitous motorcycle in, in the center bottom, uh, which a caveat pedestrian. If you don't watch where you're going, you're going to be run over, and the city knows it and really limits access and crossing major streets uh, through a whole series of subways. Uh, this is a, a Western design meets melee culture, but if you want a better sense of it. Uh, travel another five hours north by bus, uh, and uh, you come to the island of Penang, uh, and its major city of Georgetown, which um, at, at one time, as you can see by some of the architecture there, was the capital of the British Strait Settlement, uh, which included Singapore and other communities. Uh, so the British influence is still strong, and English is spoken. Um, it's, again, mixed cultures, uh, but primarily Malay. Um, the old part of the city is very walkable uh, and also very hot. Um, the, uh, the newer uh, parts of the city are developed uh, heavily with, uh, with electronics industry. You'll find, I believe, Texas Instruments and Intel there. The island has about a million population. 
uh, and uh, it is uh, earning a, a, a providing a, a good earning a living for many of the people uh, resident there. In the older areas, you'll see Chinese clan houses. Uh, you'll see Little India. In fact, we can go to the next picture here, and everything happens at night. And this is about uh, 10:30 or so, uh, and uh, going down uh, the Key Street uh, in, in Little India, where uh, people are busy shopping. Uh, from there, uh, I flew uh, to Cambodia and Phnom Penh, uh, a, um, uh, a, a city which is uh, now developing and coming out of uh, it, its occupation. Uh, Cambodia was occupied, occupied by the Vietnamese uh, through the 1990s. Prior to that, of course, it was the Pol Pot regime and the Holocaust of, of the Khmer Rouge. Um, but uh, since, um, since the, the turn of the, uh, the century, uh, there's been new development there occurring. They have now the uh, new uh, Western-style financial markets in place. Uh, and, uh, but yet you can still see at the bottom some of the historic architecture, including the French colonial uh, uh, Art Deco type buildings. Uh, this was, of course, a French colony. And, and uh, you, you get a sense of the French layout and French urban planning and the grand boulevards uh, that do exist here. Um, but again, uh, we have the world full of motorcyclists uh, that are going on. Uh, just a comment, the uh, center right uh, is the large market hall that the French built in the 30s, I think. Um, it's one of the best places for operating markets, uh, both food markets and, and uh, clothing markets and textile markets uh, uh, in, the, in a tropical climate. So uh, I traveled on from here, and, and all this development that's going on in the upper left-hand corner is an example is probably financed with Chinese money. Uh, Chinese money is going into all the road systems, the infrastructure. It's going into the investments for, for new buildings. Um, and and uh, you can see this just by seeing the signs as to what banks and who's uh, financing and sponsoring development. Uh, I traveled to, uh, up to Angkor Wat. Uh, to see that, many of you may have already seen that. It's the it's the patrimony of the country. The image of the building is on the on the country's flag, uh, and it's it's obviously worth a uh, clearly worth a visit, uh, as Michelin would may say, worth the journey. Uh, but from here, for my interest, I traveled to Viention in Laos, and I traveled up Laos, which is an interesting country, as uh, as it's emerging. Uh, it's uh, still a, a socialist communist country. Uh, it was ex-French uh, uh, colony, and you see a lot of French character. This is their Arc de Triomphe. It's built to be a couple of feet higher than, than its uh, uh, namesake in Paris, um, and um, contains, uh, uh, this is surrounded by major government buildings here. Otherwise, it's a, like a small Nam pen. It's uh, very active, uh, and What's, but what's most interesting is to travel another six hours north by bus, and I spent a lot of time on bus, to get to what I consider to be Shangri-La. Look at this lush environment, and this is the location of Luang Prabang. Uh, and Luang Prabang uh, was the old capital, uh, uh, royal capital of, of, of Laos. Uh, there's still a nice and modest palace, a 12-room palace. Uh, and in the garage is so is the ex king's Edsel that was given to them by given to him by the U.S. State Department in the 50s. Um, it's French colonial. Uh, there's a, a lovely small French buildings. There are major temples of, of the glorious design. Uh, don't go in the um, uh, in the summer because it's too hot and it's full of backpackers. And in fact, the, even high season is full of uh, Aussie backpackers. Backpackers. So this was probably the best time to go, but you still need a two-hour nap in the afternoon to get out of the heat. Uh, the um, from this delightful place sitting on the Mekong River, I journeyed north and west to get to Hanoi. And that that trip. Uh, amongst everything, this was a, uh, about a five-day trip for me, and part of it was spent uh, traveling on the Nuam River uh, by these kinds of boats uh, uh, that were there. These carry freight and people. Uh, the boat gets loaded up. People carry sacks down those stairs, and people walk down, and off we go uh, to spend the day on the river traveling and dropping people off and picking people up as we go up the Nuam. Uh, you can see that we're all busy playing kneesies in the boat, and uh, my friend next to me was 80 kilos of ice. 
uh, and uh, from there we go uh, continue on the river from uh, Nokom to uh, the village of Nongkyu, and there by bus I travel across Laos to enter Vietnam through Dien Bien Phu, uh, and uh, witness the the, uh, the sites of the great French loss of their colony uh, in the 50s, and tour the tour the uh, the monuments that the Vietnamese have. Uh, have uh, built and maintained there, and you know you wonder about the hubris of the French when they figure they can control mountainous regions such as this, such as this with one airstrip. Um, but further travel of another day brings me to Sapa, which is a, uh, a a beautiful environment, but it's a touristic center because it's connected by overnight train to Hanoi. Uh, but you go here not to see the town; you go here to see the the peoples, the mountain peoples, the the the, uh, the Hmong and the and the Dao. Uh, there, the, the city itself reminds me of uh, uh, an emerging uh, Gatlinsburg or Wisconsin Dells or, or um, uh, uh, southern Spain and places that have just become uh, terribly uh, uh, touristed. Uh, but outside of the city is a gorgeous, uh, gorgeous environment uh, to experience, and meeting these people is also a wonderful time, including the lady in the center up who I had to help repack her motorcycle after she fell over and lost all her goods. Um, the overnight train, as I said, brings me to Hanoi, uh, which is um, an extremely interesting city to visit. Uh, the, uh, it's a combination of old French colonial uh, and uh, old Vietnamese. You know, understand that Vietnam has been an occupied country for a thousand years since the Chinese occupied it in about 1000 AD. Uh, so the, the Chinese influence is extremely strong, but yet the French influence is felt uh, in terms of much of its uh, architecture, you see the Opera House in the upper right, uh, the Maison Centrale and uh, the uh, central left is uh, what we uh, have called Hanoi, the Hanoi Hilton. This was a, a prison built by the French uh, in 1850 to, uh, to hold uh, the Vietnamese revolutionaries. Uh, so uh, it, you know, a free Vietnam has been a long time coming, I suppose you could say. But while the French were there, they did several things as tax land and, and they taxed the front foot. And th therefore, you see a lot of long, skinny, skinny and high buildings because they're trying to get around paying taxes uh, against that front foot assessment uh, that goes on there. You have uh, the, the French town and then you have the, uh, the, the Vietnamese town, uh, which you can see in the uh, center right uh, and lower left, a very busy and, and frenetic environment uh, that goes on there. The key part of, uh, of Hanoi centers around Ho Kiam Lake, which you saw a photo of before. Every evening, it's full of uh, uh, families and, and uh, uh, youth and, uh, uh, and enjoying themselves, and older people enjoying themselves uh, out in the cooler air uh, and uh, going to restaurants and, and stalls, uh, going around uh, Ho Kiam Lake, and, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, doing some other things, just hanging out down by the lake. And, uh, I think in a minute we're going to see somebody. There he comes. He's coming up, and I don't know what they've been doing down by the water's edge. Um, so uh, we proceed on uh, by air to Shanghai, uh, and uh, you land in Shanghai. You get on the maglev that runs for about 11 or 12 minutes at, at, uh, at uh, 450 kilometers per hour, about 200 miles an hour. Uh, then connect with their transit system and uh, 13 lines of transit. And the most difficult part of using transit in Shanghai is finding the button that, that turns the ticketing machine into an English map uh, and, and instructions. Um, you're standing on the on the the Bund, the famous Bund, on the uh, uh, one side of the Wangpo River, looking across to Pudong, which until the 90s, as I understand it, uh, was uh, pretty much a a, a, a naval base. Uh, or military base, so you can see the amount of growth uh, that's happened there. Uh, in the area, whole Pudong region now is home to a, a major expat uh, facilities and, and expat housing as well. Uh, the, uh, you, you see uh, the other side of the, of the river on the center left, uh, and the, the uh, 1922 sky skyscrapers along uh, the Bund, which is active all night long on that esplanade full of tourists and people. It's quite a meeting place uh, to be. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of frenetic areas in this city, but uh, on the other hand, there's some quite calm ones as well. Uh, 
comment about the lower left, that is the center for urban planning. How many cities have a center for urban planning? And in the center of the center uh, is the great city model that you see here off to the center uh, uh, lower right um, that uh, uh, shows you the layout, which is pretty much a series of districts that fold themselves into neighborhoods uh, cut by a, a, a web of, of freeways. In fact, speaking of freeways, this, this uh, one uh, picture to the, uh, the top center, uh, what you're looking at there overhead is the base of a free elevated freeway system. I'm standing on the pedestrian uh, connections that connect four corners of the intersection of two arterials that are probably running uh, about 12 lanes each. Um, so traffic is intense, uh, even though there's a tremendous transit system as well. Uh, you'll find yourself major shopping on Nanjing Road. This is the center of the commercial district. Uh, another two kilometer uh, uh, length of malls uh, that are not interconnected, but you find them moving up and down the street and even riding a tram if you get tired. A little bit of old Shanghai still exists, uh, but you board the bullet train uh, for a 150 mile an hour, four hour ride that brings you to Beijing. And Beijing, of course, is the center of, of, of uh, power uh, and what you also find is Big Brother is clearly watching as you cross these wide, wider and widest streets uh, that, that go on. Um, a comment about the upper right, uh, yours truly is standing uh, in Tiananmen Square and as far as close as he could get, as I could get uh, to the Forbidden City, which is where the picture of, of Mao hangs uh, behind me. Uh, my first trip there 20 years ago, I could walk right across Tiananmen Square and and walk right into the Forbidden City. It's now controlled by a whole series of barriers and, and, and uh, minders or guards. Um, it's not there to control tourist flow. I believe it's there to control uh, uh, um, protests and, and, and other activities uh, in the square as well. Uh, Wang Fujian Road is a, full of malls uh, that's there. There are new developments trying to ape the old Hutong developments uh, that exist in, the, in tourist areas. Uh, this is interesting. I walked through the park and um, walking through the park uh, one day, I come across this little group uh, with, just like anywhere else in the world, a bunch of people posing or hanging around to enjoy the music that's there uh, and the performances by this group. But uh, I leave there uh, and I get on the train and I start my great uh, um, trek on, on the Trans-Siberian. And the first leg of this is, is uh, uh, from China into Mongolia. And as we enter Mongolia, um, you go through the act of changing the bogies because the rail gauges are different. The rail gauges in Russia and, and Mongolia, I can't remember, are either larger or smaller than the rest of the rail gauges in the world. Of course, the Russians did that because they didn't want to be invaded by train. Uh, so uh, three hours at, uh, between one and four o'clock in the morning, you uh, sit on the train as it gets lifted up and new wheels are put on underneath and, uh, and you then go forward. Uh, the trip goes across uh, the great uh, Mongolian steppe uh, and you'll see occasionally herds of wild horses uh, out here and uh, great, great distances as it goes on. Uh, and as you look at this, it's a glorious picture of, of, uh, of uh, an open countryside, but don't let that fool you. When you get to Ulaanbaatar, you will find a very sophisticated city um, that uh, over the past uh, 20 years have uh, developed a, a modern Western uh, financial system. Uh, you can see by the clothing, check this lady out over here. Uh, she could clearly be walking down the Champs-Élysées or walking down uh, uh, Fifth Avenue uh, with her mode of dress. Um, everybody carries their, 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 their cell phones. Um, new development uh, is springing up and changing. Uh, a note about this, this is the administration building and what's going on on the day I took this shot uh, was a solemnization of marriages. It was an auspicious day for Buddhist marriages and you can see families had come and brides and grooms got dressed up and brought their, uh, their kids. Um, and uh, Right in the center there is the new icon for Mongolia. It's Genghis Khan. I'm standing in Genghis Khan Square. Uh, 20 years ago, that that mausole, that area here held the mausoleum of the first uh, uh, commissar of, uh, of the Communist Party with the founding of the Mongolian Communist Party. So times change. 
and they look back to Genghis Khan uh, at, at this time. When you're in the country, you're in the country. When you're in the city, you're in the city. I got sick for three days in the city. I had a bad rep respiratory problem, and I spent it in the hostel, and I couldn't have been treated better. But I got on the train here uh, and uh, then proceeded north to Siberia, and I entered through the area just south of Lake Baikal, and what a glorious place this is. It's uh, it's 20% of the world's fresh water and a lake the size of Lake Michigan, remembering that the Great Lakes is 20% of the world's fresh water. So the depth of this lake is amazing, running to a mile deep. Uh, the mountains on the west side rise to 10,000 feet, so you literally can see across a 40-mile uh, wide distance of, uh, of the lake. It's crystal clear, drink right out of it. It's a majestic environment, undeveloped around it, uh, some small settlements. Um, that are there, and you can choose to ride the Circumbicol Railway, which was the old rail link that went around, and I did so with my friend Ho here, uh, who we spent the day together uh, and met uh, we both being both being tourists and looking for company. Um, from here, about an hour and a half drive brings you to Irkutsk, uh, which is a, a, a city of, uh, uh, might be a, thought of as a fabled city, of Siberia. It's a city of 800,000 people. You just get amazed that there are cities that big uh, that you really haven't thought of uh, in an urban sense. It's an economic center. It's somewhat provincial, uh, but you see a strong preservation effort in terms of the wooden buildings that are still maintained, and you can see them clustered here, a cluster on the other side of the Amara River, uh, and then the the, uh, the high-rise housing that is being built, uh, has been built by the government to house the, the growth of the city. Again, uh, we have the uh, uh, people dressed in high style, uh, walking down the street, uh, shopping in, in malls, both old and, and new, uh, wonderful old, older buildings from the uh, early 20s uh, uh, and uh, earlier period when this was uh, kind of the center of, of the, uh, the Siberian gold rush. Uh, and from here, uh, you travel by, uh, for, I get back on the train and travel for two days, and I come to this extremely impressive city of Ekaterinburg. This is a city of a million and a half. Uh, it is on the edge of the Urals, uh, which are relatively low mountains. They're old mountains. Uh, and uh, Ekaterinburg is here because it's the major Siberian city of, uh, of, for industrial economy. Uh, at least of, of, of the cities that I stopped at. I also stopped here because this is the site of the assassination of the Tsar. Uh, and um, I should know that Putin has has uh, uh, made peace with the church uh, and joined, uh, joined together. And this building here is the Church of the Blood, the Spilled Blood, which is the site of the, uh, the assassination of the Tsar. Uh, which at that time, it was just a, a wealthy person's home. Uh, before it was torn down and rebuilt. And, and the church under Putin's blessing is reaching out to sanctify the czar. Uh, so that allows Putin to reach back uh, over communism, which a, a, a fella in Moscow said to me, that was a bad experiment. 75 year bad experiment. Uh, and so, but to make connection uh, with, with the monarchy and give continuity to, to his, uh, his, uh, time in office. Uh, and, uh, this is the Yeltsin Center. It's like our presidential libraries. Boris Yeltsin uh, was mayor here and, and governor of the Oblast, the region, uh, before he went to Moscow to serve as mayor and become uh, uh, its, its president. Uh, a note about in the lower left, um, a note here about uh, this, this building, which is the city hall, which was built in the 20s as a constructivist or a um, a uh, Bauhaus type building. Stalin didn't like those kinds of buildings, so they added gigaws and steeples uh, to make it more befitting. And the construction work there was done in the late 40s and early 50s by German prisoners of war. Uh, the Russians were very vengeful about the, uh, the Great Patriotic War, and a lot of the repatriation of German prisoners of war didn't, wasn't completed until the late 50s or indeed perhaps even the early 60s. So I spent some time out uh, of town here, and I was in uh, out in the Sverdlovsk Oblast, which is the region uh, of Ekaterinburg, and went to the town of Nevyansk. Uh, this monastery you see here, this building is on the site of the burial site where they dumped the Tsar's family 
uh, in a mine shaft, and now it's a, a holy site uh, uh, there. And you, if you uh, go to Nevyansk, you see a village at the dis in the in the distance, um, and you see um, Dacha. So people often refer to Dasha as having a country home. Well, they're of all sizes, and these are very tiny little Dashas where somebody can live in one or two rooms and plant potatoes. Um, this region owes its existence to the need of Peter the Great for iron. This was the iron uh, ore center, uh, and he effectively charged the Daniloff family with developing this region in the 1700s, and it was so far away that the Daniloffs minted their own coinage um, and, and ruled this uh, as, as a fiefdom. Uh, from, from here, I travel for another day or so, and, and indeed, I spent the time traveling with my then found friend uh, Leonoid, he, we shared a cabin. I traveled first class, two to a cabin on, on the train. Uh, you know, I always had a, a cabin mate uh, from Mongolia, from uh, Ulaanbaatar to, um, to Irkutsk. Uh, it was a, I shared it with a woman, which was interesting. Uh, and the rest of the time shared it with men, most of them uh, businessmen uh, or attorneys. Um, uh, Leonoid and I spent two days together. He didn't speak any English. Uh, he spoke Russian and German. I spoke more German than I did Russian, so uh, that's how we conversed uh, for those uh, those two, two days together, sharing teapots full of vodka. And that was the great mosque in Kazan, uh, another city of a million and a half to two million in in the um, um, the uh, oblast of uh, the region of the uh, Tajikistan semi-autonomous republic. It's where the Russians meet the Tartars. The city is about uh, half uh, Muslim and half uh, uh, European. And the mayor, who's been in power for some time, has made that a policy to try to keep as much balance as, as he can. Uh, you see uh, uh, how significant the con new construction is, yet there's a lot of older construction. This is a typical Tatar type of architecture. Uh, if you've been to Istanbul, you will have maybe seen uh, some similar type of architecture, but mixed with the Beaux-Arts uh, kinds of architecture, that was the Belle Epoque development that you find in Moscow and Eastern Russian cities. Uh, this is uh, its Kremlin, and uh, near the Kremlin are these buildings that look Baroque. These are neo-Baroque new buildings that are flats that are occupied uh, uh, by the oligarchs. Uh, these are the minor oligarchs because they have to live in flats, uh, luxurious nevertheless, but not mansions by themselves, uh, as we see here. Uh, from Kazan, I journey to the center of Russia. Uh, it's Moscow, and uh, all that Moscow has, it's monumental, it's got terrible traffic, um, and uh, it has major, major kinds of sights to see. Of course, Red Square, stand in Red Square, and you can hear the echoes of uh, of of, uh, of of the past there, um, the uh, travel, the beauty and of its stations and its great subway system gets you all over, all over, all over Moscow. Uh, great Beaux Arts buildings is exemplified by uh, the one at the center uh, bottom, but also by the Bolshoi Theater uh, over here in the 1930s architecture, which is the uh, Russian Duma or its seat of government. Uh, one quick other comment here. We're showing you uh, new and old Arbit Streets. New Arbit Street ran a, won an international design competition, uh, and you can see the windrows that have been built uh, there. And uh, uh, while it's busy, it's still pretty sterile compared to old Arbit Street, uh, which has now been fully pedestrianized. These two streets uh, exist within a, about a half a mile of each other. Uh, uh, and uh, there's an explanation, there's an illustration. There's a lot of pedestrian streets in Moscow, especially downtown Moscow. They've taken the cars off and pushed all the cars on major streets for continuous congestion. Uh, from there, uh, I, I go to Bucharest. And um, uh, in, uh, in Bucharest, uh, I see the Ceausescu 3,900-room palace. Who can do anything with 3,900 rooms? Ceausescu being the, the last dictator of, of uh, Russian uh, of communist Romania, and then find myself into a, a pleasant small capital of of of, uh, of, uh, Bel of uh, Bucharest, 19th century buildings, lovely neighborhoods, uh, outdoor and indoor areas to eat, and of course the ubiquitous mall that keeps going on. And from here I travel into the mountains uh, and into uh, the Transylvanian hills to, to look for uh, Dracula. 
uh, and you can find them and the eyes are busy watching you uh, as uh, you're traveling through these towns um, and uh, witnessing uh, these environments. And that's the guy in the center is Vlad Tepic, uh, Vlad the Impaler. Uh, he is the, uh, the origin of the Dracula story uh, of uh, around the 1600s. And you see these lovely communities uh, that you can uh, travel through. They're easy to get to by, by car or by bus or by train. Uh, we spent a couple of weeks up in there and then uh, went south to, to um, uh, Bulgaria and uh, spent time in this town of uh, Veliko Ternovo. This is the ancient capital of Bulgaria, built on three hills. And uh, it's a lovely environment to spend time in. Uh, the walk around at the, the center uh, is this uh, church uh, and tower where you can see from pretty much all parts of the town, except if you're on the wrong side of the hills. Um, it's a great setting to be in. And then another two hour bus ride uh, brings you to Sofia, uh, the nation's capital. A lot of new development happening and you can see a lot of this right in this area here where new investment and new high rises are sprawling out uh, from its historic center. Uh, which is uh, still uh, uh, very pedestrian scaled inside, as we see. Interestingly, uh, all religions seem to be respected in Bulgaria. Here's a church and synagogue and mosque uh, that are all in operation today. Transit Strong, this is a, a transit street uh, that uh, is going through the center. You can buy your newspapers and lovely old uh, kiosks uh, that are there. Uh, and from Bulgaria, uh, I, again, board another bus. I did most of my travel, uh, if not by the Trans-Siberian, was by bus. Uh, you meet a lot of characters on the bus. A lot of people sometimes took me by the hand to make sure they got me to the right place. Uh, at times, especially in Southeast Asia, I'd get off the bus to be fed. We'd go into the kitchen and I'd order whoever, whatever the person in front of me ordered, that's what I accepted too, since I had no idea what, what I was eating uh, uh, in the countryside uh, often. Uh, from from uh, Sofia, I traveled uh, another bus ride, five-hour bus ride, uh, to Thessaloniki in northern Greece. Uh, this is a beautiful city, um, uh, and um, this is this great uh, central place that uh, I'm standing with my back to the to the uh, to the sea, to the arm of the Mediterranean that comes up to flows into the Dardanelles, and. Uh, uh, it's, it's a glorious connection back up into the hills of uh, uh, the heights of, of the city. Uh, you see this density. It's a tremendous density in the city all along. And the, the center uh, a photo uh, here is effectively the continuation of that, that space moving up into the hills. It's, it's really a pleasant place to be. You sit down here in a cafe, look out into the harbor, watch the people walking. Not bad. And wonder who this woman really is. Uh, who walked out on the balcony and I want to think looked at me and then turned and turned her back to me. But who knows? You, you have to you have to have some romance in your head while you're traveling. Uh, from there, uh, I journeyed to another quality great Mediterranean city, uh, Tel Aviv, built in uh, uh, started construction of Tel Aviv in, in uh, 1911. The beachfront. Uh, is uh, a reminder, depending upon your age, of either Cancun or Miami Beach. Uh, and it is mostly all hotels along the frontage there. Uh, but as you get into the city, um, and uh, you, you see uh, a lot of what's called the white city. It's the Bauhaus development. A lot of Tel Aviv is built uh, in Bauhaus style. Uh, and you'll see that in its buildings. Um, this is an interesting shopping mall. This is a shopping mall that's a collection of, of buildings that looks like homes in, inside of Tel Aviv. It's a very cosmopolitan and, and sophisticated city. These are, uh, the weekend is, is over. This is Sunday and the military is going back to work. They, of course, take their guns home and bring their guns back to their post. And this is yours truly and his daughter uh, having dinner on Diesengoff Street. Uh, which is a very active uh, a bar scene and a cafe scene. You eat out on the street, and it's a wonderful place to be. And it's much different than uh, the other city, 45 minutes to the south by bus, uh, which is Jerusalem. And uh, it's a white city other than the Blue Mosque. Uh, it's a white city because the British in, in 1920, in the 1920s, decreed that all construction material, all buildings will be constructed out of white limestone. 
Uh, so you see that, and that 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 uh, policy is still in place today. Uh, you're looking at the Temple Mount uh, and the Dome of the Rock, and before this, this is not rubble. Uh, this is uh, one of the largest cemeteries, uh, looking down from Mount Zion. Um, Orthodox and pious Jews seek to be buried uh, against as close to the temple wall as possible because when the Messiah comes, they can get up and walk right in. Uh, so this is um, a, a very important and, and uh, a very uh, 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 significant uh, site uh, to Jews. So uh, the, the character within Jerusalem, much different than, than um, Tel Aviv, a, a new mall and redevelopment done in a 2,000-year-old cluster of buildings, if you will, great souks to travel through and, 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 and buy in, clusters on the edge, and you've, you've heard of Amona and other clusters that the uh, Netanyahu government are building on the edge of Jerusalem. This is an example. Uh, and uh, while you see a lot of pious people on the street or standing against the western wall of the temple and inserting little messages of prayer, uh, you also uh, see here uh, the light rail system that moves through the central area uh, of the city. It's the olds meets the new uh, that are here. Uh, from here, I wanted to journey to Morocco, but I can't fly from Israel to Morocco because they don't have diplomatic relations. So I made a stop in Rome to change planes and spent a day sitting in front of my favorite building, the Pantheon, and then off to Morocco. Uh, this is the Ben Alula. Uh, Kasbah, or Kasbah, as I found out, is really an old form of condominium ownership. Uh, people own their units inside of these protective walls. Um, as we travel, and I spent three days traveling down the Atlas Mountains uh, with, a, with a driver who's sort of giving us the sign of victory I'm out in the desert, spending a night in, a, in, a, in, a, in an encampment out in, in the desert there. Uh, you see these wonderful oasis communities that are there, um, and you can see uh, Fez, this is the, the, uh, the Medina of Fez and the Mela of Fez, two different types of areas. Um, if you have a limited time uh, and you have to choose between uh, Fez and, and Marrakesh, go to Fez. Uh, it, it's a, a, a much more uh, um, uh, wonderful environment, less touristic. Marrakesh is very nice, but highly touristic. Uh, I, I would suggest spending your time in Fez, and I would suggest having a bit of French uh, as well if you're going to be out of, of uh, Casablanca, Fez, or Marrakesh. Uh, from there, I go home. Uh, I fly to uh, uh, Paris, uh, and uh, I sit in the cafes thinking about what I did, and I said, the world is a fascinating and often welcoming place. You know, if you try to meet people on, on their level using a bit of their language, uh, I had no problems at all traveling. I didn't have one adverse run-in. I guess my biggest fear was in uh, in uh, in Fez, where I got got there at midnight. The cab dropped me off at the entry to the Medina. I had a Riyadh I was staying at. Whistled for a guy who was standing there to walk me to the to the Riyadh about 10 minutes inside, and I figured for sure I was going to get rolled. But no, it didn't happen. The steward opened the door of the Riyadh and welcomed me with a cup of tea, and life was just glorious. Um, cities have really great commonalities, what I've seen. They differ by culture and character, but not by structure. You know, the, the central business district is still there. The transportation connections are still there. The, uh, the neighborhoods are still there. And I find that most people have the same concerns and aspirations. Uh, people I ran into, um, some were on the margins economically, but uh, most were comfortable within the, the context of their economy. Um, and and uh, what I learned about them, we all have the same concerns. We all say that the oligarchs in our respective countries have all the money, and then there's just the rest of us struggling to get through. I learned that travel's about the journey, leaving one's home culture and getting out of that bubble to learn about humanity. And when you do that, you learn about yourself. And that was the wonder of the trip. Uh, what I learned about myself, my capabilities for traveling, my ability to make friends with strangers, uh, and, and to experience cultures throughout the world. Some of you might wonder about travel tips, so 30 seconds on travel tips and then I'm done. Uh, you may have traveled when you were a kid getting out of college. The truth is still there. Weight and bulk is your enemy. Uh, take as little as possible and pack compactly. I've seen, I saw some kids travel with backpacks that were almost as big as I am. 
trying to get them, uh, force them into, into the overheads of airlines. Um, one week's clothing is enough. Uh, laundries and hotel sinks are worldwide. Uh, I used an ultralight rollerboard suitcase that only weighed two kilograms empty. So when I packed it, it, uh, it was totally never got much over seven or eight because some airlines won't let you carry on anything over seven kilos. So you got to be careful that way if you want to if you don't want to check. Um, sandals are great, but wear stout shoes. Uh, learn the words, please, thank you, where is, yes, no, you probably all know that. Count the one to ten in the language of your host country. Minimize your electronics. I took a phone and, phone and my iPad mini where I kept my journal and stored my photos. I didn't use a money belt because it's kind of clumsy to me, and I sewed in what's called hidden pockets. You can find them on Amazon. Uh, the only strange part was when I wanted to get to my charge guard, I had to reach my hands in my pants, uh, so maybe some people wondered about me. Um, scan your guidebooks into the iPad. Uh, declare occasional rest days, especially if you're aging, as I am, uh, so that you can keep going and spending a day in a, in a series of cafes is okay. Take those cancellations and closures and those with a smile. And, and remember that the root of travel, as Paul Fussell, the essayist said, is travail. So uh, don't worry, you'll never get lost. You'll just see places you didn't intend to see uh, on your way to finding the places that you're trying to get to. Keep a journal. Uh, it forces you to reflect upon your, your insights and what you learned during the day. And remember, it's a journey. It's not a collection of destinations. If you want destinations, take a cruise. If you want a journey, struggle on by yourself. So thanks for travel, uh, joining me, and go travel yourselves. OK, so I can look and see if there's any questions. Bronwyn says, thanks. Um, so if anybody else has any questions to type in, please do, uh, and I'll try and answer them. Okay, it sounds quiet. I don't know if there's anybody still here. It may just be me. I'm, talking to I'm trying to unmute Bronwyn because her original question said, amazing trip, Les, did you have internet access on the trains and buses? Uh, I had, no, uh, I had <laughs> the buses, most of the buses were 24 passenger buses uh, and uh, and sometimes some larger over the road buses. Uh, the train had, uh, trains had no internet, uh, the internet, I, I, but you, internet's ubiquitous um, and, and you'll find it in uh, uh, all the hotels that you go into and I stayed at, at um, uh, you know, what I would, I would call a, uh, two-star hotels, one-star, two-star hotels. I did all my booking uh, uh, through uh, hotels.com so I could you know, stay in enough places and get some extra points so I could make the hotels in, in uh, hotel costs in Paris and in Israel cheaper. Um, but there, there were no, uh, there, there was no internet on, on moving vehicles. But I never worried about uh, uh, internet. I always had it in the evening and I would find it in many, 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 many uh, cafes and restaurants in cities uh, across Russia uh, and in Southeast Asia. Ken, we're having a hard time hearing you. Ken's oh. question was, what did you think of Siem Reap as a city? <laughs> Siem Reap is like Gatlinburg. Um, uh, it, it's it's the place that you have to be in order to go see Angkor Wat. Uh, it was the first time I ran into a bunch of uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, Caucasians uh, uh, during that that the the Southeast Asian part of my trip. Uh, when you get there and you get to this uh, the pub street, you, you could be anywhere uh, in uh, um, the western part of Europe or anywhere in the U.S. that is a tourist zone. Uh, so. But you needed to to, uh, to unwind uh, and and to get in the air conditioning. When you go out to um, uh, Angkor Wat, about three or four hours is about enough, at least the, the heat when uh, when I was there. Uh, we stayed in a hotel. If anybody's interested, I'll get you the name. It was it was in right next to the the center of town. So, but it was turned in a manner that you could get away from the crowds, but you could easily walk for dinner. And I'd be happy to send it to you. Next. Well, that's, that's uh, Robert here. Can you hear me? Yes. 
You crossed a lot of international borders over your uh, journey, and I wondered if you um, have any uh, experiences relating uh, to to having done so that yeah. uh, you'd like to share. Well, yeah, there's there's three different approaches that happen. Um, the uh, you need you need advanced visas, uh, of course, for China and for Russia. Um, if you're going to enter Vietnam and not come in by air at a major international airport, you're going to need a visa uh, that you have to get in advance. Uh, for when when I went uh, in through uh, from Laos uh, into uh, Vietnam, if I didn't have the the Vietnamese visa, then I would not have been able to enter. I could not buy a visa on arrival. Um, there are a number of countries where you buy visa on arrival. Cambodia is one. Uh, you land, uh, you fill out a form, you give them $25 US and you get your visa. Um, and uh, I, I think there was another country. Uh, I think I had the same thing. I think I had visa on arrival in Laos as well. I can't be sure. Um, you know, in, um, in in Europe, between Bulgaria and, and Romania, there wasn't there was effectively no border. I, I don't know if they were Schengen countries or not, but it was almost like Schengen, um, the Schengen Agreement uh, amongst the, the common market countries. You just kind of drove right through the border and waved. Uh, so it, it really depends where you were. I never had a, a problem. Uh, the um, probably the most complex visa formality I had. Uh, was uh, going into Vietnam because you have to go into the Laotian, Laotian customs and then you clear that and you walk about 200 feet uh, into the um, into the Vietnamese customs uh, and um, they took a while looking at my visa. I guess they didn't see a lot of American passports there and then gave it to me and waved me on and I got back on the bus which went through its own inspection and, and, and went out. So it was it was uh, interesting, but uh, was not challenging. There's a note from Robert Hotz who says he was in Laos about five years ago uh, or, or something. You want to make a comment? I'd enjoy hearing. Or he's off the line. Anybody else I can talk to? Well, uh, he, said, he not, says, did you see much effect, increased tourism, et cetera, from the new high speed rail lines from Beijing? Uh, I don't know, but uh, I need before and after to understand that. Uh, the train was full. Uh, it was um, mostly Asians. Uh, there, there were some Westerners uh, uh, on the train. It was a great ride. Uh, it ran about 150 miles an hour, take, took you uh, uh, into the central station. Um, and it, it was like, uh, it's, it, it runs in the same order and kind of the same quality as the Tajeve uh, or the uh, Ave uh, in uh, Spain. Uh, if anybody wants to to uh, any further information, I didn't give me give my email address. I will now. It's uh, L Pollock L P O L L O C K at Camiros C A M I R O S dot com. Or if you don't write it down now, you can find me in the on the members listing in the Ely chapter. Um, so thanks so much for joining me. Uh, I'm happy I've had a chance to talk about it. Uh, and uh, I'm happy I have an audience that wants to listen to it. No, thank you so much, Les. That was a very, very interesting uh, uh, trip around the world, and I uh, really appreciate your putting it together for us. Uh, and uh, I have a feeling that we could have listened for uh, for longer and uh, and uh, you know, found out more and more and more about each of the many places you went to. But thank you very much. It was very really, pleasure. If people are really into this, I kept a blog uh, and I, I actually put the blog on paper so I could I could easily send it to them. It's long with photos. It's about 100 and, 150 pages or 120 pages of, of, uh, of text, but on photos. 
but it was my memories and my insights. Okay, so Robert, I guess we're done, eh? I think that's it. Yes, thanks again, Les, and uh, thanks to everybody for participating. You're very welcome.